Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, Lee Welter, Sacramento physician, and uh, Tim Snowball, who is an attorney at Pacific Legal Foundation. Welcome to the show. Uh, one of the uh, <clears throat> latest cases at PLF uh, is uh, Gundy versus United States, and uh, it's something about uh, delegating discretionary power to the Attorney General or delegating legislative power to the Attorney <laughs> right. General? Is that what it, what it comes down yeah, to? Yeah, well, yeah, it's a very important case. We're actually we're going to be uh, filing an amicus brief in that case. We're not directly representing Mr. Gundy, um, so we'll be a friend of the court brief. Um, it is at the U.S. Supreme Court. Basically, there used to be something called the non-delegation doctrine uh, early on in the days of the Republic, which basically meant uh, the people are the ones that cede all power, political power, to the federal government and specifically to Congress, all lawmaking power. So Congress is prevented from sub-delegating that power to any other agency or, or institution. It's the people who have empowered Congress to make the laws. And for about the first 150 years of the Republic, that was an actual enforceable thing. Unfortunately, like so many things uh, with the New Deal era and FDR, that kind of fell by the, uh, by the uh, highway. And so it's been 80 years since Congress has struck down a law, a delegation of power. The courts to, have struck yeah, down. Right, right, right. Con a power that Congress has given to an agency or to another institution. Um, so just recently the court agreed to hear a case that has you know, some pretty ugly facts. Uh, it's, it's a bad case. The person at the center of the case is a bad guy. Um, he had appealed his conviction on several different avenues. But the court had said, we're not going to hear a lot of these other bases for the appeal, but we are interested in this non-delegation argument that you've made. And so the court had agreed to hear the case, and so it's, it's a pretty exciting opportunity. Well, tell us, uh, tell us about this nasty case. What's, what's going on, anyway? <laughs> so this guy, Gundy, uh, was an individual. He had gotten in some trouble, served some time. I believe it was for um, some drug charges. Um, he had served his time, got out of prison, uh, committed a serious sex offense, went back to prison, served another term of sentence. In the, at the time that he was in prison, while he was in prison, Congress passed a law nationally requiring all sex offenders to register. And that was already past the point at which he'd been convicted. So by the time he got out of jail, this law had gone into effect. He crossed state lines um, and was charged again with not registering in New York, where he had traveled from, I believe it was Maryland. So he had uh, challenged the law, basically saying, well, this is re retroactively being applied to me. Because I was already convicted, I already was in, in prison serving my sentence when this law was passed, therefore it shouldn't apply to me. Um, the specific uh, sub-delegation um, at issue in our brief and the Supreme Court is hearing the case on has to do with Congress basically said... It, isn't it, first of all, isn't that an ex post facto? It, Correct. Yeah, and that was one of the one of the arguments that Congre uh, that uh, the court didn't want to hear the case on. Really, but they but they jumped in and they said we do want to hear the case on this non delegation doctrine issue, and so basically in the law and in all laws that Congress passes, if they want to sub delegate some power uh, to an agency or whatnot, there's something called the intelligible principle test, which means they have to at least uh, delineate some intelligible principle to guide the agency or to guide the institution um, in enacting and enacting that legislative power. And in this case, in the Gundy case, they basically, I think the sentence at issue was, and the attorney general shall decide whether or not this applies retroactively. Period. <laughs> Period. So or, not even, or not. <laughs> right, and so not even the guise of an intelligible principle. So it's an extremely egregious um, violation of the non-delegation doctrine, even to the point where you know we can't know exactly which court members decided that they wanted to take the case. Well, no, I mean, is that something Congress did just out of laziness or ignorance, or were they just trying to be uh, cute? Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting effect. Some would say that Congress, because of this loose standard, passes um, purposefully ambiguous statutes as a way to kind of get around democratic accountability. Others would say it's laziness. I know that most Congress people tend not to read the bills that they're <laughs> voting for, or the bills get drafted by staffers, so... Take your pick. Okay. Okay. So go on with the uh, with how the case developed. Sure. So he had uh, you know been charged under the statute. He was convicted. Um, the challenge went. I think it started at the state level. Went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And he had had I think four or five different bases for trying to challenge his conviction under the statute. And like I had said, the court had gone through and said we're not going to take any of these first four. But this one that's kind of tacked on here at the end, this non delegation issue we're going to hear the case on. And it was surprising to me and to others um, in the liberty movement or people who follow this kind of thing, because we go, wow, you know, like not only does the court only hear a case like this every couple of decades, but they have not, you know, like I said, struck down a, a law 
in 80 years. And so it's a huge opportunity. Um, so our brief, you know, and I think that the case itself in the Supreme Court will have very little to do with Mr. Gundy as an individual and more to do with trying to rein in, hopefully, this situation. Will it not be subject to the problem that bad uh, cases make bad law? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, bad facts make bad laws. Like you that. know, I think we're, we're well past that. I think that it's such an egregious abuse that hopefully we'll get a good decision on it. Well, the bright side is that there's a criminal who has a sense of justice about him. That's a real plus. <laughs> well, from from these bad facts might arise a case that we can apply in all kinds of different contexts. Well, hopefully, in, in my reading, I learned that Judge then Judge Neil Gorsuch, in a different case but similar mm -hmm. case. Uh, commented that this provision, of arbitrary provision, uh, permits arbitrary and capricious and mm -hmm. inconsistent application of the law. Mm -hmm. uh, could this previous opinion cause him to be recused from, from during this current case? Oh, I, I think that would probably be more likely if, if maybe he had been a judge um, adjudicating the lower one of the lower decisions. The fact that he has an yes. opinion on it, I don't that's think necessarily would be grounds. But matter. you know, speaking of, of his appointment generally, I think that was something that people had looked to in terms of knowing that he was someone who had expressed a desire to rein in uh, the abuses of the administrative state. That's and so we're hoping thing. that in the, in the coming decades with him on the court, that's, that'll be something that will happen. <laughs> and in, in, in the distant past, I read a couple of books that explain the lucrative games that these bureaucrats play by making very complicated rules and regulations based on the law and the discretion that they're given. Oh, okay. And then they become consultants to help people <laughs> avoid conflict. Right, right, right. The, the two books are titled Conspiracies of the Ruling Class, written by Lawrence Lindsay, mm -hmm. and the other is written by Peter Schweitzer. It's called simply Extortion. Mm -hmm. And uh, our rules are so complicated that <laughs> right. without my expert assistance, you're going to get into <laughs> trouble. We guarantee it. <laughs> so uh, it takes four, four justices to, uh, to accept a case Correct. the Supreme Court. And you have no idea which four. We, it's, you know, it's behind closed doors. I don't yeah. even think that the clerks, not even sure if the clerks that work for the court uh, no, we can we can only speculate, but yeah. it wouldn't surprise me if uh, Justice Gorsuch was one of the votes to take the case. Interesting. Uh, who who is the lead counsel on that case? Uh, I believe that's going to be Mark Miller um, from our Florida office. We also have uh, Todd Gaziano, um, our DC director. He's our, our kind of our special. on the Jamaica side, but yeah. On, on the oh, tri on oh, oh I, I believe that there's a federal public defender that um, has been assigned to the case. But I, last I heard, they're speculating as to who they're going to bring in as an administrative law expert. Um, to, to argue the case, hopefully, for the Supreme Court. Another new case is uh, Santa Barbara Association of Realtors versus the City of Santa mm -hmm. Barbara and the Santa Barbara City Council, just for good measure. Uh, <laughs> what's that all about? Yeah, so that's actually a case that I'm working on with my colleague, Miriam Hubbard. So the City of uh, Santa Barbara had passed an ordinance saying, <clears throat> if you want to sell your house, you have to get a zoning information report. So as a condition upon the sale of your home, you have to let someone from the city come in and inspect the property to make sure that you're compliant with all zoning regulations and all the code. And if you don't do that, uh, there's a statute under which you can be charged. I think it's a $500 fee. Um, I'm not sure, six months in jail, I, th I think was the... <laughs> and if you don't, if you say, you know, that you don't want to let us in, you can either be charged, or at the very least, we're going to, you know, write this form out anyway that you refuse to let us in and give that to uh, potential buyers. <laughs> okay, so uh, why shouldn't uh, the city uh, have a building inspection uh, at, the, at the point of sale? Well, it's, non, it's an unconstitutional condition. Okay. Right? Wh so why, you, why would that be? <laughs> so you are, the, the city is conditioning your Fourth Amendment rights to be free um, from unreasonable searches and seizures, which means without a warrant. They're conditioning your ability to sell your home on a waiver of your Fourth Amendment rights. And there's a doctrine, that doctrine goes back uh, pretty far. Uh, PLF's cases with the unconstitutional conditions doctrine, it focused mostly on land use. We had the Nolan case, I think that was back in the, uh, in the late 70s or early 80s that we're kind of famous for. But basically the government, uh, in a nutshell, can't ask you to waive a constitutional right as the condition of receiving a public benefit. They just can't do that. Okay. However, my understanding is that a realtor, the real estate agents, mm -hmm. are obligated to reveal any observable mm -hmm. or detectable flaws with the property. Right. There's somebody, a home inspector, checks the wiring and the plumbing and the roof and that right. sort of thing. But uh, that's not yeah. a broad net. Uh, 
to right. extort people. Right, right. right. But well, it seems like that's already a kind of an arm's length transaction, right? That the market really would be better suited to take care of if you're far better. Oh yeah, I'm. I'm just kind of curious here. They, they want to do a city inspection. Of course, they're charging the seller, <laughs> right? And they're an amount of money to do that inspection <laughs> right, right. with unqualified people. Sure. Not not to mention, you know, the Fourth Amendment. Intru- I'm, I'm well, I understand the Fourth right. Amendment, but it doesn't it seem? It seems to me that it would be that it's, uh, you know, it's 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 an, an extra layer of uh, of uh, bureaucratic regulation that's not necessary because you got to get a home inspection to complete the sale anyway, right? Correct. Correct. So, it, so it's just a, it's just an added it, burden. It seems and it it's seems du- duplicative. <laughs> right. And it seems like as a as a homeowner, if you're trying to sell your home. Not only are you required to do so, but it would be in your best interest to do so, to give that information to potential buyers to facilitate mm-hmm. the sale. So, Okay. Uh, and uh, what's, the, what's the defense? What's the city arguing? What, what are they saying? Well, it, was, it was an interesting, they, it was, it was an interesting thing. Well, first, first they hit us with a, an anti-SLAP statute. Now, SLAP statutes are strategic litigation against pu- public participation, which basically means usually those cases kind of arise in the guise of you know, uh, businesses suing each other, you're suing somebody because of their speech. You're trying to silence their speech, right? And so the, the basis for that they had said is, well, hey, we're not, we're not trying to coerce anybody into doing anything. We're just trying to give potential buyers truthful information. And you're trying to, <laughs> you're trying to you know, silence our, our, our First Amendment protected speech. But well, we got we got that thrown out uh, pretty <laughs> pretty easily. Um, they did come back with a motion to dismiss. Now that we're kind of waiting for a decision on, uh, my colleague had gone down to Santa Barbara and had an oral argument on that, where it kind of gotten you know kind of technical. But um, in a nutshell, they had basically said, well, you know, they dug up a statute that says this is a discretionary decision. Um, the, the well, discretionary. The zoning you, administrator has interpreted wait a discre- <laughs> discretionary. If you're going to get a five hundred dollar fine and go to jail for six months, correct. Correct. That's yeah. discretionary. They said, well, it's discretionary whether or not you, well, you, can, you can make it a, a discretionary decision about whether you go to jail well, or whether whether or not to impose that penalty, I guess. Or they had interpreted these. They said, well, no one's coercing anybody. If they say no, we'll just mark the form no, and we'll stand on the sidewalk and we'll kind of look and see how the house looks. So no one's getting coerced into anything. But we'll throw <laughs> in jail for six months, right? Which is an option. So yeah, it's un- un- unfortunate. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure what's going to happen. We're waiting for the judge to come back. My guess would be, um, she'll give us the option of either amending the complaint and, and coming back and trying to remedy the complaint. But um, if she winds up kind of siding with the city, I don't know how we remedy the complaint. Uh, you're not supposed to make legal arguments in a complaint, so I think we'd probably be better off in, um, appealing that decision and, and writing a brief on it. Okay. <laughs> You're as shocked as I am. I know. <laughs> I wish I had a better explanation for you, but there it is. But once, <laughs> once again, we see that uh, regulations or laws that can be enforced selectively are the, the worst evil of possible. Right. It, it leads to inevitably to corruption in one form or another. It's really sad. Well, it, it leads to uh, you know three felonies a day. Everybody is guilty of three uh, felonies you know. a day because uh, <laughs> yeah. of the uh, the vast number of rules and regulations run by or enacted by basically by administrative right. agencies uh, at federal and state and local levels, and the impossibility of knowing what they right. all are, no. a right. and b the selective enforcement uh, right. of you know the, uh, the the variable enforcement or variable interpretation of all of those rules and regulations oh, i think and i think it was james madison has a quote i can't remember which was from the federalist papers or somewhere else where he says well what is the point of having elected representatives if they're passing laws so many laws that we can't keep track of what laws they're passing we don't know what they mean and we can't predict the penalties for for violating them the fact that you elect people to represent you if that's the state of the law under which you're living might as well not be a rule of law Sort of like a slave choosing who gets to give him the beating that he <laughs> supposedly deserves, or she, whatever. It's evil. I would say so. One of the other things that you're occupying your time with mm-hmm. uh, at PLF is uh, you're, you're doing a lot of blogging, a lot of writing. Yes. And I understand that you're, you're getting quite a, uh, making quite a name for yourself uh, <laughs> as a scribe. Tell us a, a little bit about... Uh, the series that you're doing, well, starting I'm, off with uh, whether individual rights occur naturally or whether they're granted by the king. Sure, sure. So, you know, a lot of times as a lawyer, you're kind of in your office and you're, you know, doing research and you're writing and sometimes it'll be, it'll take months for you to file papers or do whatever you're doing in a, a given case. We have a blog there at PLF that it's kind of interesting, you know, I can write a blog post in an hour, hour and a half that goes up on the Facebook page or other social media. That can reach several thousand people, and so I always had liked before to blog as a means of just 
public participation and, and to kind of facilitate that. But I decided to do this series, and I really wanted to start with kind of uh, base principles, you know, upon which the country was founded, and build off of that and talk about the origin of rights, structure of government, and how often the Supreme Court has kind of deviated from those principles. So, but as far as the uh, rights occurring, <clears throat> I think anyone who's uh, studied Jefferson or read the Declaration knows that Jefferson gives two bases for the origin of rights, either God-given or naturally from the state of mankind, and that's diametrically opposed, I think, to a lot of the modern conceptions of, of where rights come from. People look at rights as privileges granted by the government. Well, the problem with that is if rights are privileges granted by the government, then the government can take away those rights at will. And I think that that's kind of uh, opposed to the founder's view. The, the, the most common place among those in my perception are the people that think that any money that is not subject to taxation rightly belongs to government mm -hmm. and not to the people who fail to pay their fair share, <laughs> is that right? Right. Well, I, I just think it's interesting. I mean, um, I'm kind of getting started in my career here, but I know people who are a little bit more established, and you know, you wind up paying you know, federal income taxes and state income taxes and county income taxes and property taxes and all of these different taxes and something like 50% or more of your income uh, being filtered through government. I, I don't think that you can characterize that as a free society fair share or not, or the amount of services you take or not, that's kind of rhetoric. And my, my belief was that, uh, based on my reading, is that in the days of the feudal lords and the serfs, the fair share that went to the lord of the manor was 10% of the production. Hmm. <laughs> right, so, so you're, saying, you're, that, saying, you're, saying, you're saying people were better off in feudal Europe. Well, <laughs> well maybe so. <laughs> maybe not by standard of living, but maybe perhaps by the, the taxation levels. Well, and biblically, it, it was a tithe, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it goes back beyond medieval times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll get to more of that before we're <clears throat> finished. <laughs> okay, so so you're you're basically making the argument that uh, is in the Bill of Rights and in the Declaration of mm -hmm. Independence that Jefferson and other uh, founding fathers made that. Uh, the uh, the origin of rights is not something that government gives you, but something that you already have. And government, the only thing they can do is uh, maliciously take them away from you. Right. Or or if if, if you if there was something as a as something you know called a good government or a limited government or the constitution, I think as it was meant to operate, you would have the purpose of government being the protection of natural rights. And of course, yes, <laughs> indeed, the existence, the very legitimacy of government being premised on the consent of the governed and the ability of the government to protect your natural rights and to be effective uh, on that on that end. And so, <clears throat> when you look at the Declaration, I think. That the natural outgrowth of that, kind of the spirit of the Declaration is embodied in the U.S. Constitution and the way they set it up, uh, whether it be the separation of powers with federalism or, like you had mentioned, the Bill of Rights. Uh, there was a raging debate in the early days of the Republic whether a Bill of Rights was even necessary because the men who had crafted and kind of designed the federal government well, went, look, we've got these, uh, you know, this list of things that Congress can do. If it's not listed here, they can't do it. So why do we need a list of Bill of Rights? You know what I mean? It seems, it seems kind of naive now, uh, I think, but um, ultimately the compromise between the two factions was to include a specific Bill of Rights. Um, it's unfortunate because two of the most important of the set, the Ninth Amendment, guaranteeing, uh, supposed to be guaranteeing the protection for unenumerated rights, and the Tenth Amendment, guaranteeing a system of federalism, are two amendments that have been rarely enforced or ignored in the case of the Ninth Amendment. That's really unfortunate. Okay, the Ninth Amendment says that if it's not enumerated, if it's not listed in the, in the previous eight, right. uh, it still exists. Sure, says. sure. Because. Okay. Uh, what rights, unenumerated rights, should the Ninth Amendment, in fact, be protecting? Sure, I think that as an example, you would say, well, the Ninth Amendment should protect uh, the right of contract. And there's a notorious case from the early 20th century called Lochner v. New York. And so for pe people from a more libertarian uh, perspective, you go, oh, well, you know, I remember a college professor when we were studying cases said, oh, now we're going to study Lochner v. New York. It's a notorious Supreme Court case, and this is, you guys aren't going to like this one. I remember reading it going, all the court said was that people have a right to uh, enter into private contracts, and the government can't interfere with that. <laughs> I said, what is wrong with that? So I think that on the one hand, um, you would have to look to the common law of England, um, the common law that ultimately the United States has adopted through the federal government and through the states to look to what rights were protected at the time of the founding, to look to what should be incorporated through the Ninth Amendment. Um, 
there have been arguments as time goes on for different newer rights or newer kind of entitlements uh, through the Ninth Amendment. Um, I don't think that is the purpose of the amendment, but at the same time, um, the anti-federalists were, or the, excuse me, the federalists were concerned. They said, well, if we give, put this list in there that has 10 things on it, you know, we're afraid that in the future judges are going to interpret this and say it's only these 10 things that are which listed is, which here, is which, which, which is what happened, unfortunately. Yeah, and so yeah. the entire purpose of the Ninth Amendment was a compromise between the two factions mm -hmm. to allay those concerns. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that that's fallen by the wayside, I think, is really unfortunate. Would property rights be uh, uh, Ninth Amendment oh. uh, rights that have uh, been kind of thrown by the wayside? Need the Ninth cases. Amendment for that. That's explicitly spelled out <laughs> in the Fifth Amendment, right? For due process, for mm -hmm. takings, and, and for property uh, protections. Um, unfortunately, as time has gone on, you've had Supreme Court cases step in and kind of modify that language mm -hmm. and not really uphold, I think, what the founders were intending. Um, you know, specifically, K Kilo v. New London jumps to mind as a case yeah. where the court stepped in and said, well, you know, we know that this has public purpose, but we're going to interpret that to mean economic benefit to the community. Meaning and higher <laughs> taxes for the, for, the, for the city. Correct. And I, I think that, you know, that was it... Uh, Justice Stevens, I think, came out last week, uh, Ouch. talking about talking. Oh, he wants to appeal talk, the talking appeal, about, re repeal. Wants to repeal the Second Amendment. Yeah, We're trying to. Well, I mean, okay, well, that you know that <laughs> we won't we won't get too far on that, but, but I'm only saying. Well, uh, but no, I mean that makes sense from a constitutional jurisprudence uh, standpoint. Right. That, I mean, if you want to change the Second Amendment, repeal it. That is the which is not right. going to happen. Right. Or hopefully, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Who knows with the uh, right. with the Parkland people uh, making all the noise and that making. leads us to another perspective, and that's that. The purpose of our government, American exceptionalism, mm -hmm. is that we are the government mm -hmm. and we have rights. And the job of government is to protect those rights, sure. not to sure. take them away. Right, right, right. I think Jefferson was the one who um, described the Constitution as, you know, something along the lines of, let you know, in questions of power, let no more be thought of man, but bind him down from by the chains of the Constitution. <laughs> right. The idea being that con the Constitution really is supposed to bind down government to preserve individual liberty. And more often than not, in the modern age, you see judges and uh, others interpreting the Constitution as a means for government to exercise power. So the Constitution was supposed to uh, limit the power of government. Uh, has that worked at all in practice? Where has it worked? <laughs> I, think, I think that, you know, we can say for roughly the first 150 years of American history, we probably had something close uh, approximating a republic. I don't think it worked out exactly as the founders would have foreseen. And would you say a republican form of government, uh, as the founders envisioned, sure. is essentially libertarian? Uh, I would say that it is more libertarian than what we have now. I yes. think that I think that one of the factions that you, the splits you had early on, would be between like a, a John Adams and a Thomas Jefferson, for instance, right? Where Jefferson would have been seen more as a libertarian, I think, and more kind of focused on the individual. Um, they were the Republicans, the original party, were the Republican Democrats, I think, was the party that mm -hmm. Jefferson founded. Whereas a John Adams would have been more uh, in favor of a centralized, more powerful centralized government um, as a means of keeping the states in line and keeping them into one, one central government. They were afraid of the country falling apart. So. They were, uh, wanted to make sure that this new, new <laughs> right, government new that they had uh, established mm -hmm. wouldn't uh, fall by the wayside. Right. Like, like the English Crown had done. Correct. And I think that they, you know, they tried kind of the loose Confederacy model with the Articles <coughs> of Confederation, and I think that um, everyone agreed at that point that it kind of wasn't working for what they wanted to achieve as one cohesive country. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the Bill of Rights is, are essentially negative rights. Mm -hmm. Tell me the difference between negative rights and positive <laughs> rights, because that's something that really set off a light bulb in my mind when I first came across the concept. Tell me, right. tell me what's the difference. Sure, sure. So it's, I think that um, I would encourage anyone to pull out their Bill of Rights and to read it. And what you'll notice is most of the time repeated throughout the uh, Bill of Rights, it says, Congress shall not do X. Congress shall not do Y. The government cannot do this. Basically, the Bill of Rights encapsulates your right to be left alone. And it's, it's a listing of what the government cannot do to you and what rights you have against the government. And so I think that, that the whole concept ha has been flipped. And again, I'll you know I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I'll point to FDR and and you know that era. Oh, the progressive era. <laughs> the, pro the progressive era, sure. And you know, uh, as a um, 
as a counterpoint, if you will, uh, FDR toward the end of his fourth or fifth term, I don't remember fourth. how many, fourth term? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Toward the Only end four, of his fourth term, he said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna institute a new Bill of Rights, and he did oh, it in yeah. one of his fireside chats, and he said, this is the new Bill of Rights. You have a right to a house, you have a right to a, uh, a home, you know, a, a job, you have a right to food, you have a right to an education, you have a right to all these things. And that is the exact opposite of the kind of rights that are contained in the Bill of Rights. And the difference being, in order to pay for that stuff, because none of that stuff's just going to pop out of thin air, right? Uh, you're, yeah. you're obligating your neighbor either to provide those services through the force of the state or through their tax dollars. So a negative right, in essence, says you have a right which doesn't cost anybody else anything. <laughs> Correct. You, Whereas a positive right by definition says it's going to cost somebody else something. Sure. If I have a, if I have a right to a, a house and I haven't paid for the house myself, somebody else is going to pay for it. Sure, sure. I think that's the thing with people when it comes to health care or education. They say, oh, it's a, everyone deserves a right, has a right to education well, yeah, or a right that, to health care. Yeah, you have a right to go <laughs> to earn money to pay for your education, <laughs> right, right. but you don't have the right. right. The, to have somebody else pay for well, your the, the hospital still need to be built. The doctors are still going to collect a salary. And so someone is paying for it. Yeah, I mean, we right. obviously <laughs> take health care. We obviously would never argue, nobody would ever argue that we, I, as a patient, have the right to enslave a doctor or a nurse. Well, some people might, but very few. <laughs> that, that would seem a little, you know, would seem a little bit like, too much like slavery, right. right? But if you make it one step removed, well, we'll enslave taxpayers mm -hmm. to pay the doctor and the nurse. That's okay. Right. Well, I think it's it's a it's a it's a directional approach. I think with friends of mine, because I, I I do try to maintain friendships and professional relationships across the aisle, if you will, sure. with people I don't necessarily agree with. Because if we can meet at friends and respect each other's differences, there's no reason for us to hate each other or not be involved with each other. But it seems to me as a, a directional approach that people that are more kind of on the left think in terms of the collective and the community, and things are kind of filtered through that frame. Whereas I think the founders and people more on the right or libertarian side of things would start uh, with the individual as the uh, irreducible unit of kind of social analysis. Well, yeah, and I think if you think about socialism as a, as a concept, it's the, the most natural thing in the world hmm. because we are all born into a socialist environment. It's called hmm. the nuclear family. <laughs> Got it. Where right, everybody, right. Uh, you know, the, the infant is all need and no, and no, uh, hmm. no production. Hmm. And, and the parent is all production and, and no, you know, right, right, right. provides all the needs. So as you're growing up as a child, you start out being the recipient uh, of a socialist mm -hmm. uh, environment. If the parents are good, they teach their children they can't be the recipient forever and they have to grow up and become adult. It's called adulting. My kids <laughs> explained that to me. But, but there is a very experienced forensic psychiatrist uh, named uh, Dr. Lyle Rossiter wrote a book describing optimal parenting, mm -hmm. which ideally we some We'll get into it next to. show. We're out of time. <laughs> we'll do that. We'll Thank you very much. Overhead. We'll see you again well, next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint, on the web at www.accesssacramento.org, on Facebook.